Well, this is the last great day, and it's no longer the Feast of Tabernacles. This is another day entirely. We usually call it the last great day. And in a way, this is a very sad day, yet in another way, it's, it's the happiest day of all, too. It's sad because we can realize that as we're all gathered here, We'll be leaving tonight after sundown as the Sabbath ends, and we won't see, some of us won't see each other again until next year. Perhaps there are some who even drop out and we don't see again from time to time. We're rather sad at having to leave all of our brothers and sisters in the church to know that now we go back out, we have another year before we'll meet again. Yet what this day symbolizes is perhaps one of the happiest things and one of the most joyous hopes that we have, and it's something that this world is totally without, that no other church understands, that no other group, denomination, or sect, or any other people has any faith in or hope toward, knows, or any knowledge of. Now, the holy days, as you've had explained, picture God's plan to us. And this is one of them. And this picture is a part of the purpose and the plan that God has. Mr. Armstrong and the other ministers have gone through and explained a number of things about God's purpose and plan, the kingdom of God and what it is, and how that the purpose of the kingdom, the millennium, and the great white throne judgment, now we want to go into this and see what it does mean. Now, as most people just don't understand God's plan, they don't have the holy days, they don't have the Sabbath, they don't have anything except the tradition of their elders doing away with the laws of God. We live by every word of God, Matthew 4.4 4 and Luke 4.4. 4. That's why when it comes to something like this ceremony that we've just had, or the blessing of the children, there is no set, thou shalt bless the children in here. But what are we to do? We're to live by every word of God. Christ set us a perfect example that we should walk, walk in his steps. And as I've heard Mr. Meredith explain, a number of the others too, that doesn't mean you take steps that are six inches long or uh, 32 inches long or anything like that. It means to live as he lived. Now, last year when we were going home from this uh, feast, we had a meeting with uh, a number of us, and it was announced, I think there will be again this year, in, in El Paso, Texas. And we, Mr. Hay and I met with some there. I expected 15 or 20 people. About 250 showed up. It was an amazing thing. We all met there in Washington Park and had a Bible study in the afternoon. And this question of the blessing of the children came up. One man mentioned how just after that they had gone home uh, two years ago, and his child had fallen from a very high distance out of a tree, and had, it, it would ordinarily have killed a child, absolutely nothing had happened to that child. And he said, you know, there must be something to that. I said, yes, if there weren't, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't. There is something to it. And this blessing of the children is a very important thing. Right there at that meeting where we were, some people were driving by in a car and struck my little niece, Kay O'Byrne. She wasn't my niece then, she is now and knocked her down and bounced her right off the pavement. We took her in and anointed her, Mr. Hay and I, sitting there in a car, and she had the tread marks from the tire right through her clothes onto her body, yet she didn't even suffer a bruise, so far as I know. There were no bones broken, nothing. God does bless these children and take care of them, and this is an important thing, this one thing that we have here. It's all just a, a matter of our living by every word of, of God, following the perfect example of Christ and receiving those blessings that do come from it. And one of the greatest of blessings that we have is the hope that we can learn about this afternoon. Now, for a quick summary, and I'm not going to go all back through all of the holy days or anything because that has been done. Mr. Armstrong has explained that, but I want to explain a quick summary about God's whole purpose and plan, the reason we were born, the reason we're here. That's what we need to understand. That's what the world does not understand. That's what all of these other churches have lost. They believe in trying to get into the politics of this world and the government. They want to change the legislature of this world and try to make this world now and these governments a better place to live. 
That is not the plan of God. But God has a great overall plan of reproducing himself, of taking us into his kingdom, begetting us now so that we can be born into the family of God. There's a reason for that, too. Now, God in this plan began the entire thing in Genesis, the first chapter, with creation. That was a physical creation, and creation began there. That's one thing you have to understand that other people don't know and don't realize. A physical creation took place in Genesis, the first chapter. That was only the beginning. Creation is going on now and has not had its complete fullness yet. Creation is going on in you, and the greatest thing of all is being created right here and now during this feast, during the time that you're here, as you get these sermons and read the Bible and learn to live by every word of God and overcome self and learn to build the most precious thing that you and I can develop, character. That is the greatest of all things that God is doing, and he won't force it upon us. We have to be willing and obedient. We have to come to him as he is the potter and we're the clay and let him mold us and shape us by doing what he says, just stepping out on it and acting on it. Now, in 1 Corinthians, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, if you will, the 15th chapter. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 45th uh, verse, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. It began a physical creation. It, although the ultimate destiny is a spiritual creation. First that which is natural, afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the eternal from heaven. And that's true from us, too, as we actually put on immortality and become God. At first we are of the earth, earthy, every last one of us, a physical human being, subject to corruption and subject to physical ailments, diseases, and death. But we shall put on immortality, and we shall be of the Lord from heaven. As uh, the first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the eternal from heaven. As is the earthy, such are also they that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So, uh, salvation, then, is not just a repairing of the damage that Adam did or that Satan did to Adam through Eve and causing him to disobey God and fall, and so we have a sin on ourselves now, and we're all born under this yoke of sin, and uh, Satan has all gotten, has got God's plan all confused now, he thwarted it, and poor humanity is laboring under a great yoke of bondage for what, for what Adam did. This is what most people believe. And God's got to come down here and repair the damage and bring us back to uh, merely the Garden of Eden. And then what we shall be is just uh, brought back to that pure state that Adam has had before he fell. Well, that's not so. And I think all of you understand that now, that it's so much greater than that that there's no comparison. I'm not going into all of these other scriptures today, but that back in Daniel, the 12th chapter, uh, if I can just turn to it, it might be w uh, well enough to read that here. Just a couple of things that I'd like to bring in. Here in Daniel, the 12th chapter, and in verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. You go along into uh, Revelation, the second chapter, and all the other places where the description is mentioned of Jesus Christ in his glorified state, 
how he had hair that was white as wool, and how that his face shone as the sun in its full strength. His feet were as burnished brass, and his voice as the sound of many waters. It thundered forth. We are to come to the same thing. That same honor and glory is our ultimate destination. That's what salvation is. That's what it means. We shall shine even as the stars, and so on. And that, uh, I think, brings that out very well. Now, it is a new creation that we're going through. It's a spiritual creation by means of a spiritual begettal at this time. Physical creation began back in Genesis, the first chapter. It began with, with Adam, and the second began with Christ. The first man was of the earth, earthy, Adam. The second was the Lord from heaven, and he became a quickening spirit. Now, character is not created instantaneously, and that's why we have to go through this life. That's why God has the plan that he does, because it isn't a matter of just preaching certain things to you and letting you bottle knowledge up inside of yourself and say, now, I understand this doctrine. I'm fully capable of preaching it to others. It takes a lot more than that. You've got to live it. You know, Christ had to do the same thing. Turn on back here to Hebrews for a moment. To Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 5 and verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Christ now, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Christ feared God, and he prayed to him constantly, even with tears and supplications. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And as was read this morning, you have him as your perfect example. You have to follow what he did. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute you. Why? The only way you can get character, the only way you can develop faith, is by having your faith tested and tried. The only way you can develop righteousness is by living it, by doing it. That's why Christ was sent here in the flesh, so that he could become a high priest that knows what manner of temptations we have. He was tried in every point, even as you and I are. He knows what it's like. He's one who can have compassion on you. Yes, even when you slip and you make a mistake. He understands that as long as your attitude is all right, as long as you're striving with all of your might, and as long as you're trying to keep close to God and to enter into his kingdom, and if you're doing this, if you are praying to him with tears and supplications, God can forgive. And Christ, as our high priest, will intercede for us. He knows when we do make a mistake, as long as it's a genuine mistake, and not something where we're just going out trying to excuse ourselves and do things we ought not. But God will forgive those things, and Christ will actually intercede for us. He, know, he knows what it's like. But the thing that God is creating in us is character. That was created in Christ. The second creation began with him and the life that he led. It wasn't something that just automatically took place in a split second when he was resurrected. That's when the fulfillment of it came in, but Christ first had to learn by the things that he suffered. You may believe that he learned and knew everything all at once when he was born. He didn't have any lessons to learn. That's not so, and your Bible says so. You cannot have faith unless your faith is tried. I know that most of the ministers in the church have at one time or another had their faith tried right down to a point where it meant either life or death. Many of you have. Now, frankly, it's a good thing. If your life is in God's hands, if you've given it to him, if you have done, as you read in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3, presented your body a living sacrifice unto God, that you can have your mind renewed by God's Holy Spirit, God deals with you, as you read here in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, as a father does with his son. And any father that loves his son guides him and trains him and teaches him and shows him where he should go. And he chastises him and tells him what to do. Now, God does that by this Bible and by dealing with us in the way he works out circumstances in our lives. He works out circumstances. A lot of times we get sick and we wonder why. 
We're prayed for, and we aren't healed immediately, and we wonder why. I can tell you why in a good many instances. The why is this, that being prayed for and being healed through prayer means that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has to be applied to your case. That's what it means. Christ died for your sins, right? He shed his blood for the remission of your sins, and we're saved by his resurrection. We're forgiven for our physical uh, sins by his beating. If we can come here and we can rest in the hope of the joy of salvation and believe in being baptized that Christ did shed his blood for our sins, we can also believe that his body was beaten and by his stripes we are healed. But the thing is, we have to do what? Repent first. You repent, then you're baptized, and after you've repented, then your sins are forgiven and not until. And very often somebody comes along and says, well, haha, I've got a cold, will you anoint me? And they haven't repented of what they did to get that cold or to get this, that, or the other thing. That's the basic thing it requires before God's going to look down on you and apply all of the beatings and everything that Christ took in your stead to pay that penalty, you must have repented for having broken God's laws, sincerely repented. And then God knows if your heart's right, if you're going to try it, to live by all of his laws, physical laws as well, what you stuff into your mouth, he's going to take care of you. Maybe that's an aside, but it's something to remember. When you are sick, you ought to think, before you do things that will get yourself sick, that Christ had to pay a penalty there, just as well as for your spiritual sin. And don't treat it cheap and lightly when you are anointed and when you have to be healed. You're asking that that beating that Christ took was taken in your stead, that you don't have to suffer. It's just something to think about. Now, uh, as the plan was explained in the holy days, comes on, it, it starts with the sacrifice of Christ for our sin. Next, the days of unleavened bread, and we put sin out of our lives. We receive God's Holy Spirit, and we have the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then we have our at-oneness, and the sin put onto the devil, and we come into the kingdom. And a time that we've just gone through in the Feast of Tabernacles when peace is restored to this earth and when God puts down all of these other governments and he ruled through Jesus Christ and through us. And then we come to this last great day, which we're celebrating here today. Now, Pentecost, we had, as Mr. Armstrong explained the other day, two harvests. There's the small harvest and the great harvest, the spring harvest and the fall harvest. Pentecost shows the small harvest, and uh, the, the Feast of Tabernacles actually does show what we were coming through in uh, uh, the uh, latter uh, harvest. Now, it began, though, with Christ and with the apostles. It did not begin back with uh, Moses and with Abraham. The first feast is the Passover. It's the beginning of the plan, as I mentioned, and the Feast of Tabernacles shows the millennium harvest. Now, the world doesn't know what this last great eighth day means. They read about a white throne and a judgment that's to follow, and you hear people talk about a white throne judgment. You can pick up pamphlets about it here, there, and the other place, and they don't know uh, what it is. They have it all mixed up simply because they don't let Scripture interpret Scripture. But uh, we're here to learn these things, and we learn them by our experience, we experience things in our lives because our eyes are opened, we're able to take the truth of God and to build character with it. Now, the eyes of this world are not open. God is not trying to save everybody now. When Christ preached and spoke in parables, the disciples came to him and said, Well, Master, why do you speak in parables? And he said, So that hearing they can hear and not understand, and seeing they'll see and not perceive, that they won't know. They are blinded now. God has not called everybody at this time. He's calling a few out at this time that they can be in the kingdom, that they can serve as kings and priests with him. Now, we learn by experience in our lives, you have to have repented, don't you? That's right. You have to repent of your sin before you receive God's Holy Spirit, and then you have to be obedient to him from then on. Well, now, why do you repent? Because you've come to see what is right, and because most of us have messed our lives up so terribly that we want to be relieved of the burden and the mess we've gotten ourselves into. We want to come out of it. 
We want to change. We realize what the penalty of sin is. We realize how bad and how filthy it is and how wrong everything that seemed right to us was and how right everything that God has is. We learn that by our experience. It's something that you just learned because you have sinned. You've had a knowledge of sin now. You've tasted it. You know you don't want that way. The entire earth is tasting sin. The governments of this world, they're going directly contrary to God's way and against his will. They're tasting what it's like to do what seems right unto a man, to have their own way and their own will, to be stubborn, to do what pleases them. They're finding out what the result is. And in due time, the world is going to repent. But right now, God has not opened their eyes as he has yours so they can see they're blinded. Your eyes have been opened. Even then, many are called and few are chosen. A lot of people have an invitation, a lot are called, but they don't persevere unto the end as they should. And as we read, in the end, there shall be weeping and and gnashing of teeth. And that's true. But we're called now, just a few, the first fruits of many, for the purpose of providing kings and priests to rule with Christ when he does come, when his kingdom rules the earth. Now, in Daniel, the second chapter, turn back quickly to this, to Daniel uh, 2, and uh, God has shown here what shall happen in the latter days in verse 28. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to this king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days. And then he explains the dream and the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had and showed how there were these governments that were to come up. And he said in verse 37, Thou, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Here's a Gentile king ruling contrary to God's will. And yet God has given him his kingdom and his power and his glory. This morning, my brother Ted read to you in Romans how we're to be subject to all the powers that be because there is no authority unless it's authority that's permitted by God. A lot of people do think still, I guess, that uh, the devil is thwarting God's plan. Don't get me wrong. The devil does rule this world. But only in so far as God permits and allows as he works out his plan and actually uses the devil in it. If you can understand what I mean there, the, the devil is no agent of God or anything like that. But God permits him to tempt us so that we can be tried. And we know that the trying of our faith works patience and uh, it has its perfect work in our salvation when it has the end of, of having our faith tried and we do go on and endure unto the end and overcome. God rules. He set the boundaries of nations. He uh, shaped the continents and laid them out as they are. You know, even though Satan can entice men to disobey God and to go wrong, he doesn't have one thing to say about which government is placed where on this earth or which people are placed in any, in any uh, given uh, territory or area. God's working that out. His whole plan stands supreme, regardless of what the devil does do. Well, coming on over, speaking now then, he said, you are this head of gold. He saw the great image, you know, and Daniel is explaining to him what the dream was. And he said, after you, in verse 39, shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and so on, a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all thing, uh, things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it uh, of the strength of iron, for as much as you saw iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas uh, thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's an interesting thing. Uh, interracial marriages and the mixture of seed uh, of men is something that in this country we still feel, I think, most people, that it's a communist doctrine. But actually, who is bringing about all of this? Babylon. And who's the greatest exciter for uh, the brotherhood of man? the great universal Catholic Church of this world. That's the one that's bringing it about. The one who's going to be the religious force behind this government that is coming up. 
They're the ones that believe in this great brotherhood of man and how that uh, we should all intermarry and intermingle and everything like that. Well, they shall, and it's prophesied right here, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings, now remember, the ten toes were the ten kings, it's this beast power that's coming up in Europe, and I'm not going into a long explanation of that, we've had articles just recently in the plain truth with a complete diagram and explanation of all of this. And most of you that are here should know, because it's been just a month or two ago that an article was in the plain truth about that. But in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and a kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So God's going to break all those kingdoms down and rule over them. And now, coming up to the seventh chapter here of Daniel, and beginning here in verse uh, 25, speaking about, again, this power, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, the persecution or tribulation that's coming, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of a time. They've been given into their hand, Roman uh, government, system, church, Babylon, the whole thing has changed times and laws. We go by their calendar, and we may by, uh, be going by another calendar that they have in this world calendar shortly. be a terrible thing. They're going to think to change times and laws, and uh, it'll be given unto his hand. They may uh, put this world calendar on us. If it does, it would make the Sabbath come up on a Thursday one week and on a Wednesday uh, I mean, uh, th uh, Thursday's on one month, and the next month it might come out on a Wednesday. You can imagine the trouble you'd have in trying to keep the Sabbath, the true Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday because only because that name Saturday is applied to the seventh day. The real name of that day is the Sabbath, not Saturday. Saturday comes from the term Saturn, one of these planets up here, which God created. But, you know, they just dedicated the day to it, like they did to uh, certain other days, other things. And if they say that uh, that uh, Saturday uh, is another day than what we call it, that doesn't make that the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a successive seven-day period after seven-day period from creation right on down. And if you don't realize that, get the booklet, Has Time Been Lost? and check up. No, it has not been. Every seventh day is a Sabbath, and it is a, a succession of seven days right down from the, the, the week of creation, when God rested after he created this earth. But now he shall do all of this and think to change times and they'll be given into his hand. But the judgment shall sit. Judgment shall sit. This system's going to be judged. And they shall take away his dominion. This king is going to lose his power and his authority and his dominion. It's going to be taken away to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints. That's you. Dominion, power, to authority to rule this world shall be given unto the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. They shall obey him in that time, because he's going to rule with an authority that won't be flouted like some of the authorities of these uh, earthly kingdoms and governments that are here now. You can get away with breaking an awful lot of the laws of men today. Will you be able to do that in, in God's kingdom or in the millennium and the time when God's uh, laws are here on this earth? No. You know, some of the, the laws are going to be far more perfect and just. That's one thing. They do have some silly laws here in this country. That's a fact. Most of them are basically sound, I guess, and still, if you were a student of law, you'd find out that there are uh, a lot of them that are slightly crazy. But nevertheless, we're going to have rule. It's going to be given to those in God's kingdom, the people of the saints of the Most High, and they'll rule with authority over other kingdoms, and then men shall obey God. He's going to at last force them to obey God. And the point that many don't grasp here now is the fact that in the millennium, during that time, we who endure unto the end, who've been baptized, received God's Holy Spirit, grown in grace and knowledge and in character, and are born again, 
are going to be ruling over what? Here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. We'll be ruling over physical nations of human beings here on this earth. We're not going to be secretly taken up to heaven for a thousand years while the earth lies desolate or while a lot of other screwy things happen that you don't find in your Bible at all. You do find that when you're born again, the purpose is to be a priest and a king in Revelation 20 of chapter to rule a thousand years here on the earth with Christ as he institutes God's government over men, over human, physical mankind. Now, that's one thing that no other church seems to realize. They want to have it here and now, and all these other churches, they want to enter into politics. They tell their people how to vote, and they want to get in and be a part of the government and of the associations of this world. They want to have rescue missions down on Skid Row and try and help people to make this a better world. God is not trying to make this a better world. He's going to bring the kingdom of heaven, and at last we're going to have what you've always heard, that old expression, heaven on earth. That's exactly what it'll be, heaven on earth. The kingdom and the government of God brought right down here to men. And all these men are going to be put away. And these churches that are dabbling in, uh, in their politics and committing fornication, because it is spiritual fornication, it's what God calls it, those churches are going to be done away too. They're not the church of God. But God's church does understand all of these things and know what the uh, plan of God is. Now, there will be both mortal and immortal in the millennium. There will be those in God's church and those who are dead in Christ that shall arise at his coming that will rule, and many of you, most of you, I hope, will be there ruling with him, being born again, ruling over mortal human beings. There will be both. That There's a difference between the kingdom and the millennium. The kingdom of God is God's government, and those who are born into that kingdom as a family, as there's a human kingdom, there's a kingdom of God. And as that kingdom rules over the earth, the millennium is merely, it's not a term that's found in the Bible, it's one that is uh, used for the 1,000 year period when the kingdom of God is ruling over the earth. I think everybody does understand that. Uh, stand that. Now I'll come to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter again, and we'll uh, get a couple of things clear here, which I did not get in that chapter before. In verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, and we all, it's appointed to all men to die once, so even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. I don't know what some people that believe in the doctrine of heaven and hell immediately now, like some of these real... Uh, People that talk all the time about spirituality and uh, like Billy Graham and the thing that my father read here the other morning, you know, about how you ought to develop a deeper spiritual sense. But what that is and how you do it, they never get down to saying. And the fact they believe that you go to heaven immediately when, you're, when you die, they know this is in the Bible. They can read it too. But they spirit, spiritualize it away, I guess, something like that. I don't know what you'd call it. It's here and it says what it says. It's very distinct on this point. Every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, who is already raised and at the, the right hand of God in heaven, interceding for us, to, uh, for us as our high priest now, preparing a place, preparing a place for us. He said if he went away to prepare a place, he would come again. And then afterward, they that are Christ's at his second coming. And then over here in verse 50 of the same chapter, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption in inherit <clears throat> incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, at the last trump when Christ comes, at his returning, as I was saying the other day, when you hear the blast on that trumpet and the world tomorrow is proclaimed, it's here. And now is come salvation unto the saints of the Most High. Some people say, you know, it's a popular thing in this world to say, well, I'm not a saint. I don't want to be called a saint. I mean, they always say, well, of course I'm no saint. How many of you are saints? I hope every last one of you is. You should be. That's what the Bible calls it, the saints of the Most High. 
And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's something you put on then. It is not something you have now. Contrary to the belief, the popular doctrines of all of the churches of this world. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now I'll come back here to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Sorry, I didn't have a lot of markers in my Bible today, and it takes me some time, a few times to turn to it. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We're not to sorrow. One dies in the church. God calls them. You read in Isaiah, the 57th chapter, in the first verse, the righteous man perishes. And a man who actually is righteous, who obeys God's commandments, is taken out of the way. And it says that uh, nobody lays it to heart. Nobody stops to think of why. And then it states very distinctly that this righteous man is taken from the trouble to come. And it says he perishes, he dies. And undoubtedly, when things do begin to get a little uh, stronger in the church, maybe that will happen to a few. I don't know. Our lives are in God's hands. He sees to that. There's nothing for us to stop and be perplexed about or quiz, will I die, will God take me out of the way? You just realize that that's in his hands and let him work it out. Nevertheless, it does show that. But he said he wouldn't have you ignorant concerning them which are asleep. And those people who don't know this are ignorant. People in this world that believe in their doctrines of heaven and hell are just utterly ignorant. God doesn't want you to be ignorant. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Those which sleep in Jesus. And here again, death is called asleep. The dead know not anything. For this we say unto you, by the word of the eternal, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the, of the Lord, or the eternal, shall not precede. Your King James says prevent. It means precede. And you can look it up in most commentaries or any other Bible and write that word in there if you wish in your margin. It's precede. We which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's what happens first. They shall rise. Now, are they coming down from heaven? No, they'll rise. From where? From the place where they are right now, waiting for this to happen in their graves. That's where they're coming from. They shall, they shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the eternal in the air. And so shall we be ever with the Lord. Now, a lot of people think that, mean, think that means that we're going to be ever up in the air. No, we shall ever be with the Lord. And it means that you will be born again and you'll ever be with the Lord at that time, but that doesn't mean you're going up in the air. He's coming back down to this earth to perform that for which he is coming. But we shall be, then we which are alive and remain to be caught up, and so on. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, come with uh, me to Revelation 2. I'm going to pick up a couple of uh, verses back here in the second chapter of Revelation uh, 2 and 26. He that overcometh and keeps my works unto the end... To him will I give power over the nations. There again, those that overcome and that keep the works unto the end. They all say there's no works, and yet your Bible says to him that overcomes self and keeps the works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Christ has received the right and the authority to rule over these nations from his father. 
will be in the family of God that's instituting that government here then. Now, uh, Revelation 3, verse 19. Uh, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And it means you should be in a condition of repenting of anything. What does it mean to grow in grace? Now, grace is being forgiven, isn't it, for having broken God's law. That's what grace means, in knowledge and in grace. As you grow in knowledge, it shows you what your faults and your sins are, and so should you be repenting and going to the throne of grace and asking to be forgiven, that you become perfect, that you shall become holy, and be ye holy, even as your Father in heaven is holy and perfect. It takes the Spirit of God to do that. And as you heard in the sermon this morning, in order to love your enemy, you've got to have the Spirit of God, because you of yourself can't do it. You can't bless somebody that stands there and curses you unless you've got the love of God in your heart, that's all. But to those that overcome, and, uh, uh, and, and to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To whom is this addressed? It's addressed directly to you. Everywhere Christ gave these parables and spoke, he said, To him that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Who has an ear to hear? The world? No. Their ears have been stopped up. Their eyes have been blinded. But if you've been called and God has taken those scales from your eyes, you are the one to whom this is addressed. You have ears to hear. And whoso has them, hear and understand. Take heed and warning that you do what you should. We're the ones that have the ears to hear. Now, Revelation uh, 5 and verse 10 over here, where they are going through verse 9, they, these were singing this song saying, you're worthy to take the book and open the seals and so on. And verse 10, have made them unto our God kings and priests, or a kingdom, and they shall reign on the earth. That's where they reign. That's where we will reign when we're born into the family of God. Now, what a judgment is isn't understood by this world, and we should understand it. Uh, let's go over to John, uh, the ninth chapter, John 9 and verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And he said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. We all say that we see. In a family, and he leaves another. He opens the eyes of one, and another does not have his eyes open. And so you find that you've got a few of us, a very few, that understand God's truth, but the vast majority of all people do not. They go on in what seems right to them, in their own eyes, in a way that's going to bring death on them. Some of our own loved ones. And we know, as Mr. Wayne Cole brought out last night, that there's only one name given by which men must be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. What about all the men that lived before him, and what about all the people that have lived since? Billions, sure, literally billions of human beings that have not understood and don't know. They've never had a chance. Interesting thing that we can take to heart, you read Matthew the 12th chapter, Christ said that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale when they asked for a sign, he said, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And he said, I tell you that the people of Nineveh shall rise up with this generation in judgment. And he said that uh, they'll, I forget exactly what his words were, let's turn back to it here, it's Matthew the 12th chapter. I turn to it. It's always better to read it, I guess, than it is just to try and quote and not know. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. And the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. You see, these people that weren't saved then, they're going to rise up in a judgment, aren't they? There's a resurrection when they're brought forth out of their graves. They're dead now and long since. 
They're in their graves, but they're going to raise up out of those graves. And they'll condemn some of us and some who have gone out from us that have known and actually known the truth and not kept it, because if they had had the truth delivered to them, perhaps they would have. Salvation wasn't open to them. All right. We're having a separation going on now. The sheep from the goats. God's calling out his sheep. He says, my sheep hear, hear my voice, and they'll follow him where he leads. Now come to First Peter, back here to First Peter, the fourth chapter. First Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, uh, which has come to try you, as though some strange thing had happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a bu busybody in other men's matters. Now that's, that's a very interesting thing. We're not to suffer, and I'll tell you this, usually people do suffer if they try that. It's just something that brings suffering. Yet, if any man suffer as a, a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Our judgment is here and now, and that judgment takes place daily, as Mr. Meredith explained, through our lives. It's not something that takes place in an instant. The verdict may be handed down instantaneously, but actually the judgment depends on what you do in your life daily, the life you lead, You'll be to be judged by your works. That's what most people don't seem to understand. Now, we'll appear at the judgment seat of Christ when we come back here to 2 Corinthians uh, the, uh, 5 and 10 and read this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that that he has done, whether it be good or bad. We shall all appear. We're being judged now by the things that we do, but we're to appear before that judgment seat. Well, now when? Come back here to Second Timothy. Second uh, Timothy 4 and verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's when, at his appearing. The final judgment, the outcome, the verdict will be handed down then for us. Because we're being judged now. Judgment has now come upon the house uh, of God. Now, we're to be given authority over mortals who live uh, now and who live through the tribulation and the day of the Lord, and who live on into the millennium. There's one thing that I brought out the other day, and I think a good many of those may be some of the children of the people here in this congregation. If they are obedient children, and if they have been taught about God and his statutes and his judgments, and if they are the kind that God is going to start to repopulate the earth and replenish it once again with human life, surely that's who he'd take first and foremost and above all. Now, after Christ is on his throne, turn back to Matthew 25, Matthew the 25th chapter, and verse uh, 31, and there's to take place another judgment. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He's going to sit there and sort of divide them and, and uh, weigh. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them in his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. In other words, the whole thing has been prepared even from the foundations of the world. It's a plan that God's had all along that's being worked out and the whole world was made for this purpose, 
And this has been prepared for those who are obedient to God, even from the foundations of the world. Now, uh, come back to Isaiah, the 66th chapter. Isaiah 66 and 19. We'll see uh, here. He says, I will set a sign among them. And I will send those that escape of them into unto the nations to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud, that draw the boat to Tubal and Javan, and to the coastlands of the isles far off, that have not heard my name, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. In other words, here's God sending out an ambassador or a teacher or a ruler, an instructor, to these nations, these Gentile nations afar off, to instruct them in the ways of God that they have not known. Now, notice the time up here in verse uh, 15. Behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. That's after God has come. There must be physical human beings here if there are those who are going to go out and teach them these things, you know. It wouldn't be one who is saved and already in the kingdom of God. God is going to take even these Gentile nations at that time. There'll be some of them, human life, that has gone on through the tribulation. It's gone through the day of the wrath of God. They'll live as human beings and go on through. And then uh, those nations will be gathered back into the places where they belong. And God's going to do away with all of the mixture of races that uh, men have tried to institute against the judgments of God and what he has set. And he's going to send those of the house of Israel, those that are born again, out to teach these people. So now come to Isaiah 11, back to the 11th chapter, verse uh, 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and uh, shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. That's the way we as men judge and reprove and rebuke now, isn't it? After what we can see with our eyes and what we can hear with our ears. But God's going to judge according to our hearts. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. In other words, with this word, this book, the Bible, he's going to smite the earth with it. And um, with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with a kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and little child shall lead them. So there are going to be little children there in the millennium. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, even as they did at the beginning. You know, Christ is, excuse me, coming for the restitution of all things. And there has been made a change there uh, from what was in the Garden of Eden. The earth physically is going to be brought back to that condition. That's true. But what God, because that is true, then men think that necessarily God is trying to take us back to the condition that Adam was in in the garden. And that is not true. That's not God's plan. But, verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain or my government, as we brought out before, that mountain means government. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's going to be a wonderful thing. It is. It's just a few years off now, and the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. I think you've heard my father say that uh, crossing the Atlantic one night, he and I were standing out on the deck on the ship, just looking out at all this great expanse of water, and I thought of this verse and mentioned it to him. And he said, yes, you know, that is going to be a joyous thing. You can realize that when you do cross the ocean and see uh, what it's like there, too. Now... Come up to Romans 11. I want to get a few verses here in the 11th chapter of Romans. Verse 25 shows here in this 11th chapter, as Mr. Hay brought out very well in his sermon, that because 
of what has happened to Israel, certain Gentiles are having a chance. And he says, uh, well, going back in verse 20, well, because of unbelief they were broken off, Israel is talking about, and you stand by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, that is, the Israelites that sinned, take heed lest he also spare not thee, if you're a Gentile. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you shall also be cut off. And if they also, and they also, if they abide not still in, in unbelief, but shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And he will. Actually, those who have fallen back in the wilderness under Moses, and all of them, they'll be grafted in again. For if you were cut off out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, in other words, even as the nature of those who were not born physically into the race of Israel or one of those tribes or nations, they have, as we've mentioned before, the nature of a wild animal. That's something that they do have. Uh, I've seen, and it's been preached here before, as Mr. Hay has explained, that war is a natural, normal means of life. It's something that should happen every 20 years at least to most Germans. Mr. Hay and I both sat and listened to a fellow uh, in Frankfurt tell us that. He said, he, he laughed, he said, you Americans are crazy. He said, why do you think you want peace? You go on and on struggling in your mind thinking you want peace? War is good for society. He said, it cleans out the decadence and cleans things up and helps us to build new again. It is a way of life to those people. They're wild by nature. Now, if any of those, contrary to nature, have been taken into the good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and this verse 26 is the important point I'm trying to get across here. And so all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, putting this together, let's go on back here on the way uh, to what we're coming to. To first, uh, Zechariah, stop by Zechariah on the way. Uh, the 14th chapter, Zechariah chapter 14 begins, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into uh, uh, captivity, and so on, and in verse uh, for his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And there's the second coming of Christ when he comes down. And then over here uh, in verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, there are to be some of these nations who are left. Everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And undoubtedly, because it says that, that may be true. There will be disobedience. There will be people who will try to disobey in the kingdom, even as there are those in the church now who do disobey. They hear a minister tell them something, and they maybe they don't like it, and they, they disobey. Well, now God has not put it in our hands to punish yet. Then he will, and those people will be punished. It'll be quick and just, and it'll be severe. It'll be what it should be at that time. And God says here that he'll punish them. There'll be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not up that have no rain, after that, if they don't take that punishment and correct themselves, then there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to all keep it, all these nations. The Russians are going to keep it. The Germans are going to keep it. All the Negroes in Africa or anywhere else, all the people of Asia, 
are going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in that day. That's right, they're going to have to learn what God's plan is and his purpose. And you know, if this thing didn't come up year by year, some people, I suppose, wonder why every year on any given day we preach the same kind of a sermon. Well, I'll tell you this, and you understand in your own human nature that if God had not instituted these things and you weren't reminded year by year, you just hear it once and say, well, yes, I understand that now as a principle, and then you forget it, you never study it, you never hear it again, and you don't really live it out in the plan as God gave it, and you'd soon forget it. Because human beings are forgetful. I am, and I know you are. And God just knows that for our own good we need to be reminded of these things from year to year. Well, they're going to learn it then. Now come to Micah 4. And verses 1 and 3, but in the last days, Micah 4, verse 1, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord, in other words, the government of the house of, of, of God or the eternal, shall be established in the top of the mountain, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the eternal and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his way, and he will walk, in, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the eternal from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, until they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, because we'll have the government of God. Now, God's calling us out so that there will be as many as are needed to institute his government over those people at that time. Those people during that time, during the millennium, who are learning to live by God's laws, their overcoming self, true the devil's put out of his way. The devil can't uh, uh, be around to tempt nations anymore, but what's your biggest trial right now? Let me ask you that. Here you are in the church of God. And a lot of people, uh, I've mentioned this before, they'll come along and they'll say to a minister, well, that old Satan's been sitting right here on my shoulder all week long, and he sure has been tempting me. Actually, what you're usually being tempted by is just your own lustful nature. That's what it is. You know, once you understand and once you come to a knowledge of the truth, itself you have to overcome. Satan has the whole world blinded. And he's, he's actually taken them away. Well, God has blinded them, but Satan has them deceived and taken them away from a truth or a knowledge of God. But you don't have that. You've come to a knowledge. You know. Now that you do know, it's your human nature that you have to fight. Well, let's go on back now. There's one more judgment, and we come to Revelation, the 20th chapter. We'll go through this quickly to see here in verse 4. Well, let's go back to the beginning. And I saw an angel in verse 1 come down, Revelation 20, from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw a throne, and they, that, uh, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, those that loved not their lives unto death, but loved God and his kingdom and his word even more, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. There's the millennium. That is the thousand years they reign. Now, I'm sure you all understand, even as was brought out, uh, I believe, this morning, that uh, God had said that the Sabbath was for a mark between your, eye, uh, your eyes and a frontlet on your right hand so that you should know a sign between you and God. What is the sign of the Catholic Church? Actually, the mark of the beast. Well, it's Sunday. Even a Sabbath is the mark of God and it's described in the same way. But it isn't only that. It's a matter of authority. That's just a mark or a sign, but the whole thing includes every law of God and living by it. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
Now, the first resurrection takes place when? 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, at the second coming of Christ. And blessed be those who are in this first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years over mortal, physical, human beings, teaching them how to govern themselves here on this earth. I think we've proved that uh, sufficiently now. Now, coming on down here uh, to uh, verse 10, the devil, uh, well, uh, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place uh, found, no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, good and bad. Here are the dead, small and great, not the dead in Christ Jesus, but the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is of life. You'll find the book of uh, in there is uh, in italics in the King James, and it's not in the original. In other words, it's life. It is a resurrection. They're given life for a little season. The book it's talking about is life that is given to them. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, come back to Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. The hand of the Lord, verse 1, Ezekiel 37, was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Here's this prophecy about the, the valley of dry bones. And it caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And he said unto, uh, uh, again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. There's been a song written about that, I think you've, most of you probably heard it. Uh, Thus saith the eternal God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin. Now, he's going to put breath into them, and he's going to cover them with skin. This is not a resurrection unto mortality. Notice what kind of body is being given here. They are not being born again into the family of God. They're not putting on immortality. They're not being raised incorruptible. He's causing breath to come into them and sinews on these bones. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Eternal, or that I am the Lord, that I am the Ruler, that I am the Master. Then, that's the time when it's going to happen. These people now don't know who the Lord is. They don't know who the Master is. They think they are, or their own government. So, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a thunder, or a thundering, and behold, a shaking or an earthquake, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the eternal God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. What's he putting into them? Air, just as he did Adam, he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. That's what he's giving to them. Then I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army, a vast number of people. And then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry. And our hope is lost, and we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the eternal God, Behold, O my people, 
I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Eternal when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. There's a resurrection to physical life. It is not a resurrection to be thrown immediately into a fire or to be brought up to heaven or, or anything else like that, or even to be immediately changed into the family of God. But notice what he's going to do to them. He's going to physically resurrect these people, and he's going to take them back to the land that is theirs that they've been taken out of, and they shall know then that he is the Lord. And uh, in verse 14, shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the eternal or that I, the eternal, eternal, have spoken it and performed it, saith the eternal. Now, it goes on to show how he's going to take this stick for the, the children of Judah and of Israel and his companions and take another stick and write upon it, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. And there will no more be the two divisions that there were before. The stick has actually gone into what tribe now? Into Ephraim. What is it? Actually, that's the throne. God's throne is where? In what tribe at this day? That's as a scepter that a king or a, or a queen holds, isn't it? A stick, a signal of a badge of office, of rulership. God's going to take that out of the tribe of Joseph, and he's going to uh, put it together with the stick of Judah, and there'll be one in his hands, and there'll be no more two divisions or anything. And in verse 24, And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd, and they also shall walk in my statutes and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the, in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. They shall dwell therein, even they and their children's children and their children's children, children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Now, uh, because of Revelation, the 20th chapter and verse 5, this cannot be during the millennium. You can check it with that. The rest of the dead live not again during the thousand years, is what Revelation 20, verse 5 said. This has to be after the time of the uh, resurrection that takes place at Christ's second coming, which is for the dead in Christ, and those who remain until the end that are changed in a, a moment, the twinkling of an eye. It cannot take place until after the thousand years is over. And what immediately pre uh, follows that? We find in Revelation, the 20th chapter, as we just read, that immediately following this, we have this great white throne and we have a judgment. And judgment has now come on the house of God. It's here and now, and it involves a process of time, as Mr. Meredith mentioned this morning. It involves your life, the way you live and what you do. And that's what's to come upon them. Now, Isaiah 65, uh, come back to Isaiah 65. And verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jer Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. Because they're going to be the people that will rule this world, and they'll rule it with the laws of God, and the law shall go forth from Zion, and at last we'll have peace and everything men have always wanted anyhow. They'll have joy and happiness and love, everything that everybody's always wanted and always sought. They'll also have happiness and something to do, because the greatest happiness we can have now is from a sense of accomplishment, and God's going to give us that too. And he says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more sense. Then there shall no more be an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. Then is when all of these babies that have died, that, that have lived maybe, what, four or five days, just a few days, and they've died, there was a human life. That human life must have uh, some destiny. Everybody that ever lived is going to one of two destinations in the end, into the fire or into the kingdom of God. And all these people are going to be raised up. They're going to have a chance. And there shall no more be at that time when God does this, performs this physical resurrection, just an infant that will live three days and then die and have no more of a chance. 
but they'll have their chance in living out a full life. God's going to teach them uh, uh, his laws, and they'll have a chance to obey or disobey. Those that disobey will be put into the fire. And those that obey will be born into his kingdom. But then is the time when the majority of the people on the face of this earth are going to come to salvation, when God actually does set his hand to save this world. The child shall die a hundred years old. There'll be a period there when they'll have at least a hundred years. And that child that's even a few days old and died shall die a hundred years old. The sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. He goes on and he is a sinner for those hundred years and he learns disobedience. He'll be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build another uh, and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. That's who they are. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. You know, they're going to have God's Spirit in them in those days. They'll be led by him. And when they ask something while they're yet speaking, God's going to answer He'll hear. Then he says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. But they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. Now, come back to Revelation again, into the 20th chapter, and see this, that we have the books opened, and another book which was opened in Revelation 20 and verse 12 which is the book of life, or which is life. And the dead are judged out of those things which are written in the book. Now, can you see that the book actually is life? It's not just pages and paper. It's a book which is life, and they're judged out of the things that are written in this book, which is what? A hundred-year period during which they live, and as judgment has now come on us, it will come on them during that time. Then is when God is going to set his hand to save this earth. Now... Let's go back and review a few things. Christ is the first fruit because he's the head, the one who is the elder brother, the one who is superior in authority to us all and always shall be. He called him out as the first fruit. Next, those of us who are being called now, only a small scattering of God's people on the face. There are two and a half billion people on the face of this earth, and here we are. We were some 2,700 strong the other day. How many now? I know not. I suppose there are less than that. There are 28 adults, plus those from Pasadena and two from the continent in Europe, observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Two places on the face of this entire earth where God's laws are being disseminated and we understand God's plan and the truth, the joy and the happiness of what God has. We don't have to labor under all of the confusion and the dilemma that this world has. We can understand these things. But that's a pretty small amount of all the people on the face of this earth. You don't even find a nation, let alone any great assembly of people. But what about all these people? What about all of your relatives that don't see now? God calls you. He opens your eyes. You understand the truth, and they don't. They persecute you. God says when they do, don't persecute back, don't revile them, but bless them and pray for them. For those who despise you and use you ev evilly, because that's how you learn the love of God. That's, how, that's what Christ did, and he set us that perfect example. But what about them? Are they essentially evil? They're doing evil things, but they think they're doing right. God says that some of us shall be put to death by people who think they're doing God a service. Now, what about those people? They put Christ to death, didn't they? What did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, now, what about all of these relatives that you have that don't know the truth and God hasn't called them? Perhaps your husband, your wife, your sons, your daughters, your brothers and, mo and, and your mothers and fathers and all the rest of these people and these poor little infants that have died. How about a person in this world who's committed suicide that hasn't understood and never known? According to any doctrine that you can get out of any church on the face of this earth, that does not understand God's truth. If they, they can read enough in the Bible to know 
that if you take your own life, God says he'll take it too, and they, they not understanding God's plan, believe that anybody, any church that is Protestant or Catholic or Jewish or whatever, if you commit suicide, that you're through right then and there forever. Well, now, is that necessarily true? There are people who've committed murders that, are, that have never had a chance. There are people who've done a lot of terrible, wrong things, and there are also an awful lot of very good people as the world today looks at good people. I've heard Mr. Meredith mention this, and I want to use it as an example. He has a grandmother. I've met her, and she's a very sweet old lady. I don't know her age, but she is uh, elderly. She's white-haired. And she can't agree with him or with us or with God's truth on hardly anything. She's a Methodist, I believe it is. And she's a very devout Methodist. She would no more touch a drop of liquor than she would anything. And you don't know how it would sear that woman. And I think I've understood this because my own grandmother was that way too. But she's changed now. She understands the truth on this. But you, you know, most of you, what it would do to her if she ever thought that she'd even been tricked into taking one teaspoonful of wine. She lives up to what she believes is right. God has blinded her. He hasn't opened her eyes. Essentially, she's very good. She does well. She means well. She's built a great deal of character. Actually, perhaps more than some of us have. I don't know. I certainly hope you're all building the character you should. But you know, people in this world build a great deal of character. What about a man that's diligent all of his life? He learns how to use the physical energy God has given him, how to employ his time to help others, how to be a good businessman or whatever in a profitable employment, how to help others, how to really build character in certain essential true values that they know as they, even they are a law unto themselves. Now, is God, just because they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ, going to take all those people and let them perish? No. And here is the answer. Actually, this truth of God, when you do come to see it, it's the happiest thing there is on the face of this earth. We can know, we sit here in this congregation realizing what God has in store. We don't have to believe in some demoniac old uh, idea of Daddy's Inferno of all of our beloved relatives being stabbed with pitchforks and burning in a fire that just tortures them forever and never burns them up. Some misery and fantastic torture. But we know that if they don't understand now, the responsibility is upon your shoulders and upon mine. God is not going to hold them so accountable for for chastising you and for spitting upon you, for rebuking you and cursing you, you're the one who is being held responsible now. Judgment will come upon them later. They don't have their eyes open, but you do. And remember, remember, whenever you're in a situation like that, that judgment is now come upon not that person, but the house of God, you. You are being judged by how you answer, whether or not you render the blessing for the cursing, and just exactly what you do. Keep that in mind during this next year and make it a part of your life. And I'll tell you this, that the way to be happy is to have God's love, and the way to be loved is to love. You know, that's just an altruism. The way to be loved is to love others. You find out that that's what makes you happy. It doesn't bother you so much anymore when people say things about you or do things to you and treat you despitefully. It doesn't. You'll have a peace in your heart that you've perhaps not known before. I hope you have. At least you should have. But there it is, and I think you can understand now, as we've gone through this. There is a, a period coming when these people in Nineveh, the Queen of the South, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, are going to be raised up. They're going to have a physical life, and even all of physical Israel is going to be raised up. God's going to put breath back in them. And then as he's preparing a few of us now for the millennium, and as the thing pyramids, as more and more people are being brought into the government, the family, the kingdom of God during this period in the millennium, then finally when billions of people, all of the hundreds of millions, are resurrected into a physical human life to have a chance to understand the things they never have now, because in the working out of his plan, God is letting man do what seems right unto him. He's not showing him his way. He's purposely blinded him from it. But he's preparing us to teach them later on. We're having our chance now. And what you have fulfilled in your ears today is enough to tell you that and to make you realize 
that you won't be there raised up in that physical life then. If you're here in God's church now and he has opened your eyes, this is your chance and judgment is come upon us. But he's preparing a few of us now for a greater job then when uh, the, the entire world will be full of his knowledge and his laws during the millennium. And then immediately after that, we're going to have billions upon billions of people and we'll have more in the family of God to take the responsibility, to take the, the duty. You can see how God has started out with Christ. He started out then with the twelve apostles and it grew and grew. And perhaps the church got smaller, but down through the ages, those are not lost. They're all being prepared for God's kingdom and there are many dead in Christ waiting in their graves now for which salvation is assured. You know that. There are a lot of people down through the ages that have been true to God unto death and loved not their lives unto death. And they're in their graves waiting for the second coming of Christ. I hope that we'll appear with them as they're raised out of their graves and then we can go on through the millennium and we actually can be there then having a responsible position in God's kingdom teaching the masses, the great army as it said, of this entire world what God's laws are, and what a joy and a happiness it is to live by every word of God. So take everything that you have learned home and remember to live it, put it into your lives, and remember that what we have is the most precious gift of all God's Holy Spirit and the truth and the knowledge that he's given us whereby we can grow and don't fall short. Remember to do everything that you should. So I'll say goodbye and God bless you until I see you all again. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.